So hello, my name is Ono Kim. Today I'm going to present to you um, the automatic program reoptimization support in Arabian Object. So brief introduction about me. I'm from um, I'm undergrad student from UC San Diego. I work on the G-Linker of the Airbnb to last year's Google Summer Code. And I work on the re-optimization feature through this year's Google Summer Code. Under amazing mentor, um, Lang and Basil over there. And I'm going to talk about this re-optimization feature on uh, this talk. So what's the motivation behind this feature? One of the major motivation is that we want to compile with O2 for only half functions. In general, the compilation time for O1 or O0 is faster than O2. So what we want to do is we first compile the function with O0, and after that function turned out to be important, we compile them again with O0, or O2. Another major motivation is that we want to perform the runtime profile-guided optimization. For instance, we want to do Devirtualization, which uh, devirtualizes the virtual function call, or instruction reordering, which prevents the uh, branch misdirection, and other types of PGOs in the org sheet as well. And this is more like a special motivation, but, but essentially what we want to do is uh, uh, those, we want to use the high precision floating points in the earlier generation and the low precision floating point in later iteration. So observation here is that after a few iterations, the parameter have converged already enough. So we want to run later iteration just fastly. And you can notice here that this is where we want to recompile the program while program is still running. So something kind of funny is that I use the find file feature in ID a lot. So while I was um, looking for the re-opt file, because I'm working on the re-optimization, I found this file like constantly popping up. And it is called reoptimized1.txt. Uh, and the file is from 2003. So apparently, LVM has a feature called reoptimizer in the earliest generation. Uh, I read through this doc. It, it is doing quite different than what I'm doing right now, but it shares the same name. So when I'm working on, on the reoptimization, I just constantly see the file and like look at the history of the LVM. So before going deep into this, I want to give a brief overview of the orgjit. So in order to understand what orgjit is doing to transform LABM into JIT compiler, we want to look into the user executable generation pipeline. So in the user executable generation pipeline, we have a front end, and which emits the IO module. And we have a back end. And they're going to emit the object files in the end. And we have a linker that links this object file into one single executable file. So how Orkjit um, make this different is that we swap the last step. So instead of dumping object files into the file system, what we do is we just dump them into the memory. And then we, instead of linker, we have a glinker, which links the object file in memory to the executable form, still inside the memory. So benefit of this approach is that you can see that it shares a huge portion of the pipeline with the ahead of time world. And this is more like a major motivation, but there's fewer, fewer breakage caused by the LABM internal code changes, because all the file format is relatively standardized. So we have a lazy support. For instance, if you give a front end AST or IO module, it will begin compiling only when it is actually called. We support our major of the file format and architecture natively. And what that means is that in most of the case, there's no limitation on one, one you can use on the gym mode of the LPM, because we are emulating object file format um, really accurately. For instance, you can even use a very special feature called SCH exception, um, which is hardware exception caching mechanism. Um, on MSVC, because we are emulating COF object file accurately. We support uh, runtime. So for instance, we can run static initializer, drive local storage, and runtime symbol lookup, so you can runtime symbol lookup the JIT symbols as well. And we have all other cool features as well, uh, such as multi thread, um, remote process, speculate compilations. So what's new here? So what I have added to uh, to this JIT API is that before my pro our project, what well, our project received the IO module, and it gets translated into the binary code. 
And this is the end of the story. So that binary code got fossilized and not really being able to change it again. So now what it can do is that the binary code can request the reoptimization. And the object will perform the user defined transformation, which can do whatever you want. And now the org will recompile the binary code and swap it. So let's look at the basic uses of the reoptimization API. So we have added something called LL layers it. It looks something like this. First line adds the reoptimization layer. So by adding this line, you're saying that I'm going to use the reoptimization. Second line split the IR module. And the reason why we want to split the IR module is that we don't want to recompile entire IR module every time individual function gets reoptimized. So what you want to do is you want to split the compilation unit into function unit. And last line as a lazy compilation layer. By adding this line, I'm, you're saying that I'm going to lazy compile everything. And something you can notice here is that if you erase the last line, then you lose the lazy compilation. If you erase the first line, you lose the reoptimization. So you can see that the API is flexible enough to um, you, make you choose what you want to use and just um, use whatever you want. All right, so the core part of the reoptimization API is the reoptimized layer. It inserts the instrumentation code and reoptimization request code. The user callback reoptimize function um, does the custom reoptimization. So it looks something like this. So there's like uh, the function parameter looks different, um, complicated, but if you look at the middle part, it, you see the IR module. So you can just perform any types of transformation here. And this line is setting the reoptimize function. Another core part of the API is the add profiler function. It is called to add instrument syntax code to the first version of the function. So this is where you specify when I'm going to run the reoptimization. So for instance, the default is the reoptimize if call frequent, which requests the reoptimization when call count is high. So this is an example. So this performs the O2 optimization if the function was called more than 10. If you look at the middle body, you can see that it is building a new path manager. And it is running on, on the module. And we just set the reoptimize function and add profiler function so that we use them. So I'm going to show you the brief demo of how things are working together. So what I'm going to show is you is that I have enabled the reoptimization support in the Clang level. Clang level is a LLVM's in C++ interpreter. It's more like a JIT compiler, because um, you're not able to interpret everything, but um, it is running C++ code incrementally. The code originated from CERN's clean, which has been used to uh, analyze LHC data. So there has been a real use case of this. So let me stop us here. <coughs> right. So this is the Clang level. So it is like incremental C++ executor. So you can see that you can just include the std on IO and print the hello like this. So you can see that it is just running on just in time. And you can define a variable like this. And let's print the what's inside here. It is printing one right now because like variable contains one, obviously. But if you change variable into 42 and then print what's inside again, then it prints the 42 now because everything is just running incrementally. So what I have done here is that I have enabled the reoptimization support in client level here. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to execute this piece of code um, in the client level. So it contains the two functions. So function, the first function has a name. Um, this is actually just no loop. And the reason why the function is named this way is that if you look at the root body, it is adding something to the unused bar, but that unused bar is unused, um, as the name suggests. So the optimizer will figure out this is actually not useful at all, so it will just delete them. But in the OGO mode, this is not going to be deleted because there is no optimization performed. So I'm going to try running on this thing over here.
So as you can see that um, since this is actually just no op, gets executed a lot in that um, running many times function. Um, that is um, running at 10 to the eight times. Um, the reoptimization has requested. So you can actually see the dump here. So this is the original um, IR module of the this is just no op. You can see that it, ha it contains a lot of things. But after it gets reoptimized, re Um, now you see just nothing. So as you can see that reoptimization uh, happens and Arabian optimizers were uh, clever enough to figure out um, there's nothing needed here. So you might be saying that you're just showing like IR files, like is it really happening on the runtime? So let me actually show you this. So one thing you can notice here is that the inner body of the this is actually just node um, executed um, 1,000 times and we are running that 10 to the eight times. So that is 10 to the 11 time. And that's actually a lot for a computer to run in one or two seconds. So if I run this code, we re-optimize this as an op. Then you can see that it is hanging here because um, it is not able to re-optimize uh, this unused variable. But if you turn on the re-optimization, it exists immediately because it is able to re-optimize the thing and just remove entire thing. So it is running only 10 to the 8, which is enough for a computer to handle. So let me briefly review um, what's going on under the hood. So the redirects to this, oh, like, oh. I'm sorry about it. So, um, so the redirection to new symbol happens at the G-Linker level. And the re the, what I mean by G-Linker level is that when it sees a direct jump to symbol location, it records all the call sites. And when the reoptimization happens, it rewrites the jump offset of the call sites. So we are actually rewriting the instructions. And when this is not possible, we just fall back to the trampoline approach uh, where we um, update the function pointer. And the example of where this is not possible is we are indirectly holding the target where we are not really able to um, modify the instruction or require offset is too large to fit into the 32-bit, for instance. And when platform prep, um, prevents the writable and executable memory, there's actually a way to work around this, but we, by default, we just fall back to the template approach. So here's a brief um, diagram of what's going on. So first, uh, first line is that um, indirectly calling the function. So you can see that there's a trampoline going on here that is using the func pointer. And this func pointer pointed to the, this func input version one, which contains the actual body of the function. On the other hand, if you look at the second line, it is directly jumping to the func. So you, you can see the instruction actually get rewritten to the point at the function input version one. So when new, when new function implementation appear because of the reoptimization, what it do is we first update the function point of the trampoline, and then we rewrite this piece of direct jump into point of function implementation version two. So by doing this, we, we've um, removed all the indirect cost um, that can get by reoptimization. And this was actually a pretty good uh, gain we got. Because we, for instance, for here, we are now not doing indirect um, jump, but just jumping directly. So reoptimization API is like flexible enough to implement a lot of stuff. So one example I'm going to talk about today is devirtualization. So the reason why we need devirtualization is that um, if you look at the how virtual function of the C++ is implemented, so this piece of code is using um, the virtual function meow. If you look at the IO module here, you can see that this piece of code loading function address from the V table. And we are doing the indirect call to that function address. So there's a performance implication of this. So it is hard to align this virtual function call because the destination address is decided on, on time. And it is not just the indirect cost we are paying for, but we are losing opportunity for potential optimizations because the values are just not within the same base block. So how devaluation solve this is that we look at the candidate destination addresses in, in line some of them. And if the function address is no one, we use the inline body. Otherwise, we fall back to the indirect call. 
So this scheme actually has been used inside the usual PGO of LBM for infrastructure. So what we're doing is that we're essentially just stealing what they're doing, but make it work in just in time. So something I want to mention about how this is implemented on the Jet side is that when virtualization is going on, we add this like little function called to work RT incremental function call counter, which is used to collect the destination addresses. But you know that glinker is capable of linking just any object for a file. So what you can do is that we can implement this function using C++. You can just um, use your C++ and use a STD on the map to collect the destination address and compile them and make it a .o file and just give it to org, then it'll, it'll just in time compile it into the GDL code. And since org API support remote um, process, this can happen across remotely as well. So I'm going to skip this. <laughs> so let me show you the benchmarks. So I have run the benchmark uh, like this. So I have run this program called Boost Spirit, which is a DSL parser of the Boost. Um, it is 10K lines of code. And you can see that O1 turned out to be the fastest. O0 was actually the slowest one here. And since O1 contains the um, less compilation overhead, uh, o it is actually faster than O2 in the n equals 1 case. But you can see that your optimization is right between O1 and O2, trade, uh, providing a trade off between the O1 and O2. And when M becomes huge, you can see that the O1 is actually now the uh, slowest one here, because it is slightly slower in the runtime performance. And O2 is now fastest here, and reoptimization is like the right middle in between them. And the reason why reoptimization is slightly so slower than the O2 is that we're compiling the function twice, so which makes sense. But we can see that it's uh, kind of giving a nice trade-off between them. So this is the benchmark that shows the devirtualization capability. I have um, the benchmark using the ray tracer program, that which uh, uses a lot of virtual function call. O0 turned out to be very slow. It's like 100 uh, seconds. And if you turn on the reoptimization, it's um, twice faster now. And O2 is slightly faster than the reoptimization. But when you turn on the devirtualization, it is now able to beat the non-reoptimized O2 by 5.6%, which is like not drastic, but I would say pretty substantial. So there's some issue I want to discuss here. So there's a direction between inlining more and compiling fast. So first thing first, uh, we like to reoptimize by function level because we don't want to recompile every like module. And what that means is that we need to split the IO module into function. But we currently have no standard way to inline out of module functions. So we lack some inlining data that happened in the non reoptimized mode. And the runtime performance drop observed to be as bad as three times slower. So what I'm doing to avoid uh, this right now is that I just don't delete the function when it's fully done the module, but just mark them externally available. But um, this does introduce compilation overhead. Um, and it's, if you think about it, it's as on squared a function duplicates, where n is the number of functions. So the future goal will be we'd like to look into the LTO framework of, uh, for OXIT, which can be used to tackle this inlining issue. We, we don't, which can, and, and it can also bring more performance to non-reoptimized applications. And we really, really want to look into optimizing, optimizing some functions up front, because the penalty we get when we couldn't optimize certain functions is that um, the cost for instrumentation plus the loss optimizations. So we are double losing here. And we might want to look into generic deep profile guided optimization framework. We might, if you're able to use the existing PGO framework of LRBM, then I think that'll be really cool. So thank you for today. Thank you. Uh, now it's a question session. Anyone has a question can line up on the microphone. All right. Hey there. Uh, great work. Uh, I just had a question. If you considered um, how you can extend ORC to handle like kicking out jitted code from memory or like removing it if you were to like re-optimize multiple times instead of just once. Like how you can like 
unmap it and know like the threads are not using that code oh, anymore yeah. so and all that. That is actually the issue we are investigating right now. So like, so there, there's one idea. So like one idea we have implemented right now is that we just have a counter in front of the function. And if they, so we just increment the counter every time we in, enter the function. And if we exit and if it is zero, we just remove it. But I think one, one example, like one cool way we can do it instead is we can, act, we can actually just, um, you know, just like a JVM, we just like look at the sex trace back of every like thread and look at which function is actually being used and like remove them. I think that'll be really um, cool components of optimization we can get. Yeah, I think that'd be cool. Any other questions? Hi, uh, I'm curious, uh, what are other use, users or big users of uh, JitLink or LVM JIT other than uh, Clan Rappel? So uh, I really like, so, so Clan Rappel is currently using them and Julia is using it very uh, seriously. Uh -huh. I believe there are a lot of like, like other, on, like I'm not really known vendors. I, I believe PostgreSQL is also using that, but I'm not sure how they're using it. And, and Swift mm. is trying to use it also. So there's like a growing, number of users. Okay, so they, they also gonna use re optimization. Have they tried it? They, Julia, did they try to use re optimization? Yeah, so the, since this is implemented on the like NABM API level, uh -huh. uh, Julia can definitely try it out. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't really tried it out on the Julia yet, but like that'll be a really cool um, place mm -hmm. where I can try this out. All right, thank you. Hi, um, I'm wondering whether you have tried an example where the unoptimized function, the, the function that you're profiling, is running for a long time, um, that uh, if you use the O2 optimization at the first time, it would have run for a much shorter time because of, say, loop unrolling or, or uh, say, vectorization, right? Mm -hmm. So first you run the unoptimized version, and isn't it going to be um, less performant to use re-optimization in those cases? Oh yeah, so like if you, so, so currently if you just not use all this learn time profile guided optimization, mm -hmm. it's definitely going to be slower than usual O2 cause like we are compiling function twice, right? Right. But since we are now optimi like optimizing something that like previously not possible before, mm -hmm. we are actually gaining something back. And I, I so if you look at the, um, Oh, it's not showing it. So, but like, if you look at the deversalization like benchmark, for instance, it uh -huh. was able to beat the O2 non-reoptimized version back by adding some optimizations. And I think if you add like if you add more runtime optimization, it will be like able to get more performance like increase. I see. Thank you. We we'll have one minute. No more question. Okay. Then thank you, Sanghu. Ah. Uh. We'll start our next talk in five minutes. <laughs>